Hello everyone, I'm Gemma Starr and welcome to number 92 of Heart Warriors. Heart Warriors is a series I've been guided and inspired to do thanks to my energetic connection with Kata Judah. As you all know, Kata Judah is the sacred masculine site in Central Australia, very close to Uluru, our sacred feminine site. So what I'm here to do is to give a platform to men so they can share their journey into the heart, their highs, their lows, tools, practices, insights or wisdom, what worked for them specifically on their journey that they can now share with the other men walking this path and of course us women who are walking right there beside them. Today's guest is a man from Costa Rica, and his name is Darren Austin Hall. Now, Darren is a song channel. He's a shamanic sound healer, an author of sacred sexuality and conscious love. He's a spiritual teacher, philosopher, and poet. Uh, he leads retreats, intensives, and workshops, and shares his legendary druid medicine ritual sound journeys all over the world. So really looking forward to chatting with Darren and hearing all about his journey into the heart. Enjoy. Darren Austin Hall, welcome to Heart Warriors. How are you today? Very well, Gemma. Very happy to be here. And you're in Costa Rica, right? I am in very hot and dry Costa Rica. There should be rains by now, but it looks like Gaia has other plans this year. Oh. So it's very warm. Interesting. Oh, great. Well, let's find out a bit about you and ultimately, you know, um, how you got to be the man you are today. So I mm. always like to ask the men to find out a bit more about themselves, like for us to find out more about you by asking who's the man inside when you drop all your labels of sound healer and, you know, um, men's facilitator, all the other things that author, poet that, you know, you, you see yourself as on the outside world. Who's the man inside? Well, these days, I feel like I'm really, really getting in touch with the feminine side of myself. So I feel like this very kind of innocent troubadour living in a land where Gaia is so great and glorious. And I'm definitely doing some deep integration of my childish self. So I feel like very tender, loving, innocent man these days, following the heart and just being in awe at Mother Earth and the guidance of, of her wisdom, which tends to happen very fluidly in a place like Costa Rica, where she is just so powerful. Yeah, yeah, I imagine it's just beautiful there. Are you like in the jungle? <laughs> Yeah, I'm in I'm in uh, Santa Teresa area, which is in the Nicoya Peninsula. So it's one of the most beautiful stretches of coast on the Pacific side. And I'm living up in the hills. So yeah, it's just jungle everywhere. But you can hear the ocean from our house. It's it's right down below. It's beautiful. Wow, sounds absolutely amazing. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that insight. And yeah, I totally get that. Nature does that, right? Really, you know, connects you in into your heart energy. Um, so little Darren, what was happening with him? What was his major challenge growing up? Well, I think I've always been a very sensitive man. And I think always been very artistic. In fact, with the sound healing work that I do, I was I was born as a channel and this is only something that I've really been owning in the last couple of years so I was constantly hearing music I was clairaudient and I would sing myself to sleep every single night and I had a very difficult time with it because you know my parents who were incredibly tolerant of this very noisy gift I would say um you know they put me on social conventional tracks of taking piano lessons and such and I just hated parroting music back and doing recitals and just uh, when a sheet of music was just placed in front of me, I was like, but I just want to sit there and, and invent yeah. and, and be in this creative, creative nexus <clears throat> of flow state. So for me as a child, I think I was perpetually a little bewildered and confused on how to fit in with those gifts. 
Um, but I excelled at, you know, sports and school. So I was able to fly under the radar and just be kind of normal in some ways. Um, but there was always this mystical side of me, you know, very artistic. And when I discovered I was a poet in my teenage years, I started to really lean into more of that artistic side. And and now it's, it's really, I'm, I consider myself a spiritual artist. It's, it's my life's work now to just create. And I feel blessed that I've been on a track in my life where I, I'm able to do that and, and subsist myself and be able to travel the world and, and continue to evolve those creations. And so now when I look back, my inner child, I have such an endearing, affectionate relationship with him because I realize now that some of those years of, of struggle and sorrow, and they weren't that sorrowful. I, I was very blessed. I had beautiful parents. I have a twin sister. Uh, but now I really understand, you know, a lot of the eccentric things I was doing as a child, which I, I really pray that everyone does that. And and some of the work that I do as a healer is is helping people restore that that grander sense of their destiny. Yeah, this is fascinating because, you know, this whole um, artistic side, creative side, you know, very interested in this now because, you know, our children come through often with these gifts and they're suppressed or, you know, like parents with good intentions, oh, my kid's musical, I'll give him piano lessons and learn sheet music when, you know, they've got this innate uh, creative side can you please speak to parents on um, the best way to expand their children's creative side and uh, if their child maybe doesn't seem to be creative uh, do you suggest trying to focus on that side or what do you say to parents that's a really good question I mean this whole paradigm of conscious parenting is becoming much more I think normalized as we have this spiritual awakening on the planet. So, you know, you spoke to it. I think a lot of children come in with gifts and uh, more and more people and parents are awakening to this fact that we are, you know, a spiritual mystical collective, a species uh, and the, the soul has its eternity and it's maybe transmigrating. So I think one thing I learned uh, studying a lot with indigenous elders, I've been really blessed. I'm originally from Canada and we call our indigenous elders, first nations peoples and being around them, you know, they, they really uh, drove this point very clearly that, you know, you come in with your medicines and everyone has a gift. Everyone has a medicine. And generally when we're children, it tends to be an uninhibited expression. So there is this kind of tender point when you're a child where you, you're, you're not in touch with the judgments of society yet. You don't know what the status quo is. And, hopefully you're given space. So I would say to parents just to give their children a lot of space to be curious, to really explore themselves. And then I think for parents, it's very good to just recognize that context that when they're very young, before they've been socially conditioned, they've still been conditioned on a soul level. So get very curious about them, like observe them, see where what passions they have already, what are they interested in? And then slowly, positively, you know, nudging them along those paths, I think can just help navigate, you know, the terrain eventually when, you know, we become more in the clutches of culture and can lose, you know, a sense of what we really adore and love to more or less try and fit in under all those immense societal pressures, especially when you're a teenager. So I think just, and, and I had that with my, my mother in particular, she recognized I had an artistic gift. And I just remember as a young child, having this very primal encouragement from her. And that meant the world to me. It just, you know, there's nothing like the lovingness of a mother to a child, you know, it just makes you feel that Shakti, that goddess has got your back. And, and I think that gave me fuel for life, you know, to constantly nurture this gift and believe in it and believe in the beauty of my ability to serve with that gift. So I think just giving that encouragement is very key. And then, I mean, we have this challenge right now with, you know, people are really rendering it rightly. I mean, we live in a matrix and and what happens when the children leave that nest, you know, then they're thrown into a world that can be very treacherous. And I know in a place like Costa Rica, one of the reasons a lot of people are moving down here is there is no matrix. It's what they say, pura vida, you know, the pure life, because there tends to be a lot more of a blank slate here in terms of creating your own lifestyle. Eco-villages even are starting to blossom. 
Um, so, I mean, if parents have that ability to start grassroots movements, I think now more than ever, we've got to start to create our own sovereign communities. I mean, especially when you just look at the corruption in our political world, it's so, it's so scary these days in some ways. Yeah, well, let's uh, look at, you know, the future with these gifts of creation coming through. Where do mm. you think... Now, you knew it in yourself as a child and you followed it through now to, you know, where you are now as an adult. Where does the, the gift of our unique gift of creation come from? Like, you know, I've got my ideas when I have my creative spark, but where do you feel it comes from? And when it is channeled through you, you say you're a song channel. Where Where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that because I teach sound healing. I have a cat an academy called Source Resonance, and one of the modules that I teach is the ability to be a sound a sound channel, what I call a source singer. And I teach a lot about how this moment of creative spark that you've mentioned, it, it's really amazing when you zoom in on that, you know, because that's perhaps the most blissful point in an artist or creative's life. And we're all artists and creatives in some way. Uh, you know, you can speak about being lauded from whatever you've created in the world and having that audience appreciation. I mean, that's amazing too, to just feel acknowledged in that. But I think if you ask any artist, like what is the most beautiful thing about their craft? It's it's about the crafting. It's And, and then zooming in, like these things just zip into us. Like, where do they come from? So, you know, I, I really didn't understand my track as a, a sound channel until I started working with shamanic healers. And it was then that I started to really appreciate that in their culture, everything is spirit. Everything is a connection to a higher mind, a higher soul. That relationship is the most important relationship in their life. So they have this beautiful humility about them that their gifts are more or less coming through, that we're all seen as like divine instruments, like that hollow bone idea. And when I started to really get in touch with that, not only did that confirm a lot of the things I was doing as a child, which which I kind of like detached from for a time, kind of like, oh, that was just some weird thing I was doing as a child, just hearing all this music and singing and writing all these songs all the time. Um, but then all of a sudden with that context, I was like, oh, wait, that's, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm available for. Um, so then it became actually about my spiritual path, actually supporting my creativity. Cause I start to realize if I'm going to be this channel, you know, I want to make sure it's pure. I want to make sure that I've tended my instrument, you know, so health and wellness, all these things play a part when I perform, you know, when I perform you know, for lack of a better word, and I teach my students this, you know, I do a lot of prayers internally. I have a whole bunch of sacred objects. I play crystal bowls as well and other instruments. And and I go through a whole setting of my stage, of my sort of little multi-dimensional temple, you know, that I build. Uh, and all those sacred objects that I put down connect me to a different thing, a different intention. And by the time that's all done, I'm like, I'm really aligned. And then my ego is sort of not you know the dominant one i'm more just like in this soul connection um so that that i think is very key for artists too i think that's why things like meditation as well are becoming so crucial to artists these days i mean even people like albert einstein and nikola tesla great scientific inventors would say that during meditation when you get into that more soulful state of consciousness that's when their revelations would come and they would come out of nowhere just like poof. And when you really hone in on that, all of a sudden it's like, well, this isn't necessarily there in Austin Hall. You know, this I, I put out albums. I've just put out my first book. Yeah, it's written by Darren Austin Hall. But really internally, I know that I'm just like this humble servant for allowing this stuff to get th come through. And that is a relationship that has no end in the surrendering of it all. I mean, my my sound journeys that I do, which I'm most known for, they just keep getting more and more powerful and beautiful for me i mean hopefully for others who experience them but for me they do because i'm i'm perpetually expanding this understanding and and my devotion to these things it's just it just gets better and better which is amazing and last thing i'll say on that is i think artists who are more you know really using their ego as a resource for their creativity 
um, and this is a hard and fast rule, but I think they, those, those artists may struggle a little more in the enduring innovation of their work because they're, they're really connected to, I think, which is something that is a little more limited. Yeah, I can resonate with all this, Darren. Um, you know, with my own writing and poetry, that bliss state. You know, the gift is always. Sorry, my dog keeps jumping on my. <laughs> That's why I'm going up. Amazing, <laughs> love it. And my camera's balance very precarious. I, I, I'm I, I, my lap. <laughs> I'm I love it. I know. I'm seeing it. I'm like, is there like earthquakes going on over there? <laughs> no, it's just the dog. I love it. Anyway. <laughs> I can, right. I can totally relate to that. And yeah, it's, <laughs> the gift is in the act of creation. I think it's because we're actually, for me, connected in that zone, in that space to source, to something more than us. And we can feel it. I feel it coming through me. So I love what you mm. said about the divine instrument. You know, I've often written that too. That's what it feels like, you know, that we're just the playing it and you know the music coming out at the other end of we are being played by mm. so I love all this absolutely yeah, yeah it's, it's absolutely. so important isn't it because creation this bliss point and this um point of connection to source as you said Tesla you know came out with his best ideas in this in this in this energy you know if we can all tune into it we would build you know the most amazing world right <laughs> absolutely and I think that's coming I mean I think more and more people are realizing um, that the crisis is consciousness on the planet and that's why you know spirituality and wellness I mean you've probably seen it in just the last decade alone there's just been exponential growth of interest in all of these realms you know it kind of started with yoga yoga was one of the big like kind of gateway drugs i feel into the mystic <laughs> and now it's just oof, plant medicine ceremonies you've got psychedelics i mean sound journeys or i mean when i first started i was in toronto canada i was probably one of the only guys you know playing these crystal bowls and doing this thing and now it's just they're everywhere um and and that's amazing to see so i do feel that more and more people are realizing that we have to make this shift internally you know there's something that, there's a soul adjustment to borrow as what pythagoras would say and if we start to make that adjustment and we start to realize on the level of consciousness like when you meditate it's like you all of a sudden realize oh there's a part of my consciousness that that is like in a healthy way, detached and just able to observe all this tumult, you know, all these emotions that if I engage them at times, it could be like really painful, you know, anger, sadness, they can just like possess you. But all of a sudden I can step back and I'm in this place where I can just watch these things flow by like rivers. It's like the thoughts aren't necessarily stopping, but I'm perched at like a higher plane. And then the most amazing thing about entering into this deeper state of consciousness is the insights the revelations it's like you're plugged into this higher realm of wisdom and and i think more and more humans are realizing like my gosh if we can actually and eckhart tolle talks a lot about this in his books he was one of my first kind of entry points into this stuff you know he he really talks about you know it's egoic consciousness that's a problem and if we get in touch with this more you know through that present state this more soulful consciousness that's going to bring all this intelligence in that can solve all the problems that that beingness and and it just brings that like baseline contentment into people's lives so many i think wars and stuff are actually projections of people's just inner torment you know totally in agreement let's look mm. at your adulthood darren uh what would you say was your rock bottom moment as a as a man what was happening Ah, oh, I mean, there's been a couple. I mean, I think something that I've had to travel with a lot and, and why I've become so interested in writing about sacred sexuality and Tantra is, is really just trying to figure out how to be a healthy sexual individual uh, in a culture that seems to be really disconnected. And, and also as an individual who was very sensitive, uh, who did not necessarily fit into the alpha male norms that were kind of being projected onto me by culture as the way things should be. And, um, and then also when I had my spiritual awakening in my early twenties, 
Uh, I mean, that's always been an age old problem for spiritual people, right? It's like, how do you encounter these upper three chakras to borrow that model that are all completely mystical and and you know they see the enlightened state they they love the divine and then the heart's kind of this intermediary and then of course you get into the three lower chakras and that's where like your drives your primal energy is like your emotional body um like how do you really bridge those together um, so I think two two moments come very clear to me. One was when I was at university, uh, which is a which is a time in one's life when you're supposed to be, at least I thought, you know, going around sowing your wild oats and having all kinds of lovers and romps in the hay. And I I was absolutely like devoid of any sexual activity. I was depressed. I was confused. I didn't know how to fit in. It just casual sex had no appeal to me. Um, I found myself just not connecting to what culture was telling me was the right way. And then on top of that, I had, you know, um, a whole world of sexuality swirling inside of me that wanted to be expressed, you know, and what we don't, you know, express, and we repress, it becomes sort of this torment in us. And, you know, part of that was I actually had worlds and fantasy worlds within me that I also found a hard time like connecting with. I was always very attracted to Amazonian women, for example. And it wasn't until much years later that I worked with Dr. Gabor Mate, who you might know, um, that I started to realize that some of the abuse that I suffered as a child, because um, my father was actually um, physically abusive. He was a good man. He just came from South African upbringing where it was like normal. Um, but what that did was it created this kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, kink in my sexuality where I was seeking kind of this being dominated, you know, and there was parts of my sexuality that were very intense and I didn't really know how to deal with them. So I dealt with a lot of shame and shutdown and which essentially led to a lot of pornography addiction, but I wouldn't say it was like normal hardcore pornography, which absolutely did not turn me on at all, but I was more interested in very eccentric realms of fantasy of being dominated by stronger women and all these things. And it just felt very confusing for me for a very long time. And it wasn't until my 30s when I started to attract beautiful women who started to open me up to realms of expression, to realms of liberation, that I started to get a handle on these things. And then I started to dive into sacred sexuality, into Tantra, and I started to realize like, wow, the sensitive side as well that was always there aside from all this interesting fantasy side, this very romantic side that was super tender, that just wanted to write love poems like an ancient troubadour uh, that I also didn't know how to fully express. You know, I was that guy who would actually scare women away because I'd write a love poem after the first date and they'd be like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> um, but it wasn't until years later that I found a context for all that and and ways to to channel it, you know, because I think in some ways when I was younger, I was a little too passionate. I didn't know about tact and things like this and to tr tr truly be, you know, a gentle man. Um but, you know, and this is a lifelong journey. Like, I don't want to stand here and say I've figured all of this out. Like, I still work in and out of therapy. You know, pornography addiction is something that I've got a handle on. But, you know, you're always tempted. You're always dealing with a world, especially, that's like not got it figured it out. So as we start to forge ahead, we've got to start building that culture around us of support and, and reinforcement, um, which is another struggle in itself. Yeah, well, this is a fascinating uh, topic and uh, one I'd like to expand on also. And you or have named your episode um, The Sacredness of Love, Sexuality and Romance. So uh, let's get into this. Um, sure. Let's talk about romance because, you know, we often talk about love and sexuality. What part does romance play? Yeah, you know, there's this very beautiful uh, passage that I'll paraphrase from one of my teachers. Now, I haven't met this gentleman in in face to face, but I've read so many of his writings. His name is John Lamb Lash. He's an American creative mythologist, and he's an expert on the Nag Hammadi Library, which is this ancient text that was discovered about, um, I think, in the 1940s, but it dates back 2000 years. And he's also a student of history in a very deep way you know he was the first to bring my attention to the troubadours you know existed in the 11th 13th century in the pyrenees region of spain and france 
the chivalric knights, you know, all this idea of the knights going on a quest to prove their gallant, you know, virtue before the ladies. Um, and he wrote this quote where he said, you know, romance is this very ancient tradition that has so much depth to it. And the modern world, because it's so disconnected from the sacred, the romance that we see in like rom-com movies and such, it's just so far removed from what romance truly is about. And, and for me, what it's really about is when you look at, and I'm going to be a bit heteronormative here because that's where my work comes from. That's what I identify with. And, and I think this is just needs to be contextualized that men and women are playing out like a very ancient cosmic union. You know, if we think of in the ancient world, there was the God, but there was also the goddess. They understood this. There was the yin, there was the yang. These polarities were were played with. You know, if you go to India, you'll see these ancient temples where you have the Shiva Linga, which is so graphically a phallus inside of a yoni or a vagina. I mean, it's right there. And they worship this. This was like, there's there's temples where you'll see gods and goddesses, you know, the gods and the Dakinis in like absolute orgies, you know. And this idea that men and women are kind of two parts of the one whole circuit. They're like two halves. And this is kind of why we're attracted to each other. We're, we're seeking this fusion and really identifying that when men and women come together in an intimate relationship, you know, outside of the framework that maybe pop culture tells us, which is like, it's going to be convenient to then get sex, you'll raise a family, blah, 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 blah. But when you realize like there's a deep source and inspiration of growth that you can both inspire in, in each other, there is sexual alchemy that you can do, like lots of practices to heal energies in your bodies. Uh, if you're cultivating your lovingness, you know, which gets into some technical tantric details, uh, your lovingness, your loving partnership could be one of the biggest drivers of your evolution. And this is why, you know, Magdalene is being remembered. This is why Yosardara who was Gautama Buddha's wife, is being remembered now. We're starting to realize that this story, that it was this male kind of avatar bringing forth Christ's energy, to speak to that, uh, may have not been the full, the full case. Maybe there was a woman there as well. Maybe Christ is actually Mary and Jesus. And maybe there is this context where relationships, that lovingness we feel for each other, can have almost like a cosmic uh, proportion there you know when you're in bed with your your lover at night and you know one of my favorite tender moments is you know just cuddling in the middle of the night waking up in the middle of the night you know and giving your beloved a kiss you know and you just feel this this sanctity there's like a, a heaven on earth uh, they called this the nymphian you know the field of energy that's created when two auras I, I speak about this a lot in my book you know there's there's a poem called the Nymphian. I, I've written a song on my last album called Nymphian. Like when I discovered the principle of the Nymphian, which is from the mystery schools, that two auras come together to form this force field around the lovers that protects them, that actually makes them transported to higher realms where they disappear from view from any negative entities. It's like, wow. All of a sudden romance is like this. <laughs> to me, it's like a holy grail. It's like, this is what we've been searching for and you know last thing i'll say here is in the gospel of philip which is at the nag hamadi library one of these lost gospels of jesus's teachings there's an allusion to the fact and jesus speaks that uh the the source of all problems on earth is the conflict between the genders you know so well if men and women can figure out how to come back together into a partnership-based society which we know from the paleolithic and neolithic eras before you know recorded history finding relics of, you know, stone cave art, um, cultures that had no weapons, you know, they were living in relative peace with the earth for thousands of years. What's that about? Why are we not taught about that possibility in school? Are we returning to that? Is there a new renaissance, a new octave of that expression that could be restored on this planet where, you know, as I sing in, in my song, Lovers in the Temple, where we're so in love with love, we have no time for war. You know, is that is that a potential? Yeah, so good, Darren. I want to clarify the difference because when you spoke about that beautiful concept of, you know, the lovers embraced and then there's the the aura there protecting them, what's the mm. difference between love and romance in that sense? 
I mean, I, I see love as kind of like, it's the child of romance, you know, in a way. Um, and, and they speak about this, actually. They say that when lovers come together, they create children of the mind. Um, in some esoteric Christian traditions, they call it the abler soul. They say two lovers will um, create, conceive this kind of divine entity called the abler soul, which is kind of the result of both of their souls commingling. And this will exist as a kind of shining nimbus above both of their heads, and it will emanate their love to the world. I mean, you start to realize like the love in our relationship can help heal the world. Like there's a metaphysical context for this. Um, so I see like, you know, when, when I come to this, you know, and the beautiful thing is like, it's already in our vernacular, like people call sex making love. But when we actually take that literally, like we are making love. And the beautiful thing about this is there's science around this. And I, I, I teach a course, I'm in the midst of a teaching right now called Sacred Sexual Bliss. And I borrow from some of the new science, especially as author Marnia Robinson, amazing. She wrote Cupid's Poison Arrow. They've discovered the science around when you're doing a lot more bonding behaviors in your partnership, meaning spending more time cuddling, caressing, actually even having management around uh, how passionate your lovemaking is. Because if it's too frenetic, if it's too wild, if it's too animalistic, it can actually throw the nervous system out of whack. So there's this beautiful method called caretza, which came out of uh, America, actually, in the 19th century. And it's based on a slower form of sex where the energies are allowed to circulate. Um, and then, you know, choosing to be orgasmic, not, not always going for the orgasm and realizing there's other forms of orgasms that can happen, particularly for the context of a male who's ejaculating losing you know his semen each time there are ways to actually like cultivate instead of lose energy in these experiences and you can feel high for days it's a mood medicine you know it develops oxytocin in the body which is one of the most miraculous hormones it's the love hormone um there's so much i mean that's the beautiful thing about our age now too is the science and the spirituality is is starting to collaborate um so I would say, you know, romance is kind of the context and then the love is to be made, you know, and, and love can be made to infinite degrees. Um, and, and I don't think romance should ever stop. You know, there should be a constant, uh, you know, there's this meme going around, like you should never stop dating your partner, you know, in a way. And in, in the chivalric traditions, you know, it was about the man earning the love of a woman, you know, does that earning ever end, you know? I know for me, you know, a, a woman tends to be much more of a barometer for my soul than anyone else, you know, especially my intimate partner, because she knows me more than anyone else. So she's going to know when I'm off, when I'm not on my game, you know, and then she can maybe subtly, compassionately encourage me to get back on online. Yeah, this is great. Let's talk to, let's bring it back to men, Darren. Um, could you please speak to men who are, realizing that maybe you know the sex they've been the love they've been making the sex they've been engaging in isn't bringing them maybe the depth or connection that they're now seeking and you know they're hearing a lot about this sacred sexuality conscious love where do they start how do they start connecting at that deeper level yeah that's a great question um you know, when I teach my course, I, I start off by giving people the historical context, you know, to, so that we can realize we are coming, we are the product of thousands of years of uh, persecution, manipulation, religious orders that have turned us against our bodies, against nature, against our sexuality, just because the wound of shame is so prevalent and I would say men are at a greater disadvantage than women because women are tend to be given, they're encouraged more to share their emotions, whereas men tend to armor up and lock these things down. And shame is a tricky one. It it lives as, as um, Rod Boothroyd, who wrote an amazing book on the archetypes, uh, he, he talks about all these different emotions and how they can negatively affect the body when they're not expressed and they're repressed and they all tend to locate somewhere, you know, grief, for example, tends to locate in the lungs. Uh, but shame it's, you can't find it. It's like everywhere. It's all over the body. 
So I try and give men this context, you know, like, hey, brothers, like, don't feel bad that you may be carrying some wounds around how you're conducting yourself in the world. Maybe you've done some heinous things to women. Uh, maybe there's some things you're ashamed about. And it's not to let them off the hook, but it's just to say, like, this is where we come from, you know, and then we are the ones that can start a new pattern. And then a lot of it is actually getting men to engage their sensuality, to engage their feminine. You know, we we each have masculine and feminine traits within us. Um, this polarity that's just yearning to happen. And when we realize how to pull in this integration of these traits, so, you know, getting men to really look into, yeah, you're lifting weights, that's great, you're getting strong physically, but are you getting strong in your softness, in your tenderness? Are you doing things like yoga? Are you meditating? Are you dancing ecstatically? How are you opening your body? You know, it's great that you're putting all this muscular armor on, but how are you opening your body? Now, of course, you know, consummately in the act of lovemaking, a woman can be the teacher to a man to open his body. And that's amazing too. But the other thing is to be in preparation for that. I believe that men also look at, they have to look at their passion, you know, their sexual passion and, and realize that we have all been manipulated to be highly lustful beings. We've been taught and conditioned to objectify women, to treat women as these objects, not just for, you know, our physical consumption, but our, just our visual consumption. You know, something that I learned a lot with pornography when I started breaking these cycles, you know, I'd be very observant of myself. And I'd notice when I was out and about, I was just my eyes were always like hungry. You know, there's this hungriness to just consume, to objectify. And that was driving me kind of nuts, actually. It was creating a lot of duress and unrest inside of me. And then women are so intuitive. They're so intuitive to masculine energy, energy in general. They they wouldn't want to connect with me or any man who's in that. You know, they they want a man who's more a captain of that passion. Because at the end of the day, when we get into a lovemaking session, which will hopefully be more of a partnership, respectful, honoring, beautiful, sensuous, epic tale, you know, the woman knows that for her to actually have the full orgasm that her body really craves, that womb heart orgasm, it's it's not going to have any correlation to the orgasms that men are usually connected to and have been conditioned to, that quick five-minute, you know, just going for it and then ejaculating, you know, that's not going to serve her pleasure. So she's inherently, I think, even if this is unconscious for her, our bodies are so intelligent. This is the other thing. When you really get into sacred sexuality, you realize your body has all the cues. You know, as Osho said, all you have to do is start loving each other, you know, touching each other with love and let the bodies happen. Let there be this intuitive intelligence. It can take a bit of getting out of the left brain for people to get into that session. But so I start men with, you know, getting into their softness, you know, journaling even can be a great exercise and just getting that intuitive flow state going in their consciousness. And then just looking at their habits and their addictions, you know, and looking at how they can slowly start to uh, bring their passion and their lust into more control, you know, and be more of a captain of that. And then when it comes to the actual lovemaking and the actual romance, it's a lot more about being curious about the woman, you know, about what are her needs? How can I, you know, I wrote in a poem once, I love learning to love you, you know, like how to restore a sense of mystery to lovingness. Because a lot of men are trained to be secure all the time and I've got it all figured out, you know, blah, blah, blah. And there, there is something beautiful and mature about, you know, being in your Shiva and like being strong in your center. But when men and women are doing this dance together, there's a lot more mystery that needs to be included in a man's life. And he needs to realize that when lovemaking is happening, it has to start with her pleasure first, for one, because like her yoni is the one that will say, I am ready. You know, there's no penetration until that gateway is really primed and ready to receive. And that entails a lot of foreplay. Uh, and then when the lovemaking is happening, if she's feeling like she's in a safe and trusting space, she's going to be more of the leader in that sensuality, you know, and she's going to just melt away all of his armor, but he's going to have to learn to both be in this captaincy of love, but then when to yield, 
you know, which is when we have that marriage of the masculine and feminine interplaying. Kind of doing a broad stroke of the evolution here, but no, no, this is fascinating and something I'm very into as well. So let's continue this subject. Mm, okay, sure. so for a man, I'm thinking I could be wrong, but in the sort of you know the the basic lower chakra sexuality, that would he be mainly in his head, you know, with goals to achieve? With do I need to, you know, give her an orgasm? Do where do I need to touch her? All these things, or do I just do it for me? You know, very much goal orientated, and um, you know, um, trying to plan it. Whereas in the um, in the in the more conscious evolution of sexuality, how much is the mind and how much is heart, and are there any other power centers? What's the energetics of it at that higher point? Yeah, so I'm I'm glad you 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 said the word goal. I believe there, and I think that's something that is just so crucial is to get rid of goal oriented consciousness and move more to journey oriented consciousness. Now, this can be a really radical shift, especially for a man, you know, and, and for men and women, actually, a lot of sexual acts are kind of like demarked by the male orgasm. It's like when he's had his orgasm, it's over. And generally, because once he's had his orgasm, he's in absolute lassitude. There's not much more going to happen, generally speaking. Um, but it even can get to the point where if he's practicing semen retention and he's choosing intentionally not to have an orgasm there can be moments where women are not used to that and they can even internalize some shame around oh i'm not doing it right he's supposed to have an orgasm he's supposed to ejaculate so there's some conversations that have to take place to kind of re-educate around those things um but i think that that's a huge it sounds so subtle but when you when you get into journey consciousness and realize there's no goal here you know, I, I often just counsel lovers, you know, start with context, you know, create a little ritual, do some eye gazing, make some cacao, play the music, light the candles. You know, if you're going to really interact with each other in a sacred tantric way, you need to block off some time in your life because it's not going to just be a 30 minute quickie. You know, it's going to be maybe an hour or more. Um, and the actual coitus, the actual penetrative sex Maybe it arises, maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're gonna you're gonna just lay there and play with some oil, you know, and just massage each other and be in a very reverent makeout session where the kiss can be the most hot thing that happens. And and maybe the coitus does happen. And then it's about how can we like expand it through the breath and really make it last a lot longer. And when you start to learn how to circulate energy within the body, I mean. It doesn't take much. It's really about being conscious with your breath. You start to realize pleasure can be animated and amplified far beyond what we've normally conventionally seen it as. Uh, you start to realize the orgasm is potentially just like a stop along the way, that there's many other plateaus, many other mountains that you can climb. You can take breaks. You know, why not take a break? I love, you know, just taking a break and maybe listening to a song together and being in that cuddling moment, you know, not being afraid to talk honestly and crack jokes, even make lightness. It can really turn into this like hours upon hours of just playing with energy. You know, they call it generative play uh, in some tantric traditions, because the more the sexual energy is allowed to expand, the more energetic you become, because it's it's literally the genitals are the generators. You know, it's the volume dial where your, your pleasure gets to be turned up. And if you're circling around the body, you become what the ancients would call the Taoist, the soul blending embrace. Like you start to become this kind of one creature as Leo Tolstoy you know, said once, you know, I don't know where I begin and they end and vice versa. You know, it's like you just meld and it can get super mystical at those points. Um, and the head can be like... You're not going to be in any egoic thoughts. You're going to be in that nymphian again, you know, that heaven on earth, that love temple. And and this is why a lot of the ancient masters were starting to see all these hidden scriptures are coming forward. And they talk about, like Buddha said with your Yosadra, he's like, I achieved enlightenment in the bedchamber. You know, I achieved enlightenment under the banyan tree later because there was a need at that time. Most people were living in the fields and were you know, toiling away. I was a, I was a royal, I was a prince. I had access to all these privileges 
And out of the goodness of his heart, he said, I want to create another form of enlightenment uh, for people who don't have the ability to do like tantric lovemaking all day. Uh, but he did say, you know, that those enlightened states of consciousness that they would get to in the throes of that soul blending embrace, that was when he first achieved enlightenment. I find that absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and this is great. And I was going to ask the question, you know, for men who see sex as orgasm being as what's in it for them sort of thing, you know, I was going to say, well, what's in it for men at these, you know, sort of uh, greater conscious levels. But I think I can expand that question into what's the purpose of higher consciousness relationships? Like, Maybe people, um, you know, with a sort of um, when we're at a lower frequency, you know, security, maybe for children, um, maybe for sex, maybe for material, you know, um, gain, all the reasons, the loneliness that people want to get into relationships, but higher consciousness relationships, totally different thing, right? So let's open this Ooh, conversation. Yeah. What's in it yes. for men, let's say, rather than just the, you know, the white picket fence and, and a wife who's willing to, you know, give them sex twice a week. What higher conscious relationships, what are what's in it for the man? Let's say. That's a great question. You know, I mean I I've I write very boldly about this how sacred sexuality and conscious partnerships can save the world. I literally believe they can save the world because, you know, before I get into specifics specifics of the man, just for the both partners in general, uh, if you're running this kind of sacred sexuality, uh, they've now found that you know addictive patterns. Um, even wound healing, your 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 longevity in life, all these things get like super amplified because you're enthusing the most powerful vibrations that you can feel in your embodied life, which is sexual pleasure. I mean, this is why the ancients went so hard and focused on this stuff. They were just like, this is the way to raise the vibration most powerfully. So if that's a cultivated practice for years and years and years of, of your life, you're literally giving yourself the most healing energy that you can feel. I mean, I think there's going to be frontiers of science around this where we're going to find that sexual energy can heal all manner of things. Um, specifically, they say it works on uh, balancing the endocrine system, which is the physical representation of the chakras. So that alone, the verticality of the energy too, bringing it up all the way to the head, you know, to empower the pineal gland, which gives you this natural mystical state. And the pituitary gland, which is the master gland that rules over all the other glands. I mean, that can in itself cause miraculous healing. But when we get to like an actual, what's what's the deal with the man in this situation? Well, I would say that if a man is devoted to this kind of partnership, he will have goddess in his life. Because his partner will start to take on the qualities of the archetypal feminine. He will start to, especially in the throes of sex, when you get into the just the primal sea, if you slow things down and your lingam is penetrating inside of this womb space, you know, you're being enclosed and received by this warmth, by this energetic space where life is 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 grown. I mean, that in itself, when you just get into that, it's like, oof, like that's what I am inside. Like zooming in on these things is really profound. And then when a man learns how to open a woman's heart in the act of sex, because there's said to be a channel from the woman's yoni all the way up into her heart. And this is based on the polarity teachings of Tantra, where, you know, we have a negative or an electric and a magnetic pole in our bodies and it's reversed. Uh, this is why there are these differences between the genders. And you can see it very, it's very logical. I mean, the electrical energy goes out, it protrudes, you know, you have a lingam, it's protruding from the body. For the woman, you know, her breasts protrude, but it's also her heart. Her heart is kind of like this strong electrical energy that emanates into the world. And then it's vice versa. You know, obviously her yoni, yoni is the receptive magnetic. And for a man, his heart is his yoni, which I find really interesting. And when a man is able to pierce her heart, when he's able to make love to her in such a way that these chambers in her womb start to open up in this channel ignites 
uh, and she starts to experience these womb-like orgasms, this energy will come up and burst open her heart. And this feminine energy that the world has tried to absolutely crush, the great mother, the source of infinite love and tenderness, will slowly but surely start to come out in the world and start to shine its light. And a man can take great reverence and great knowing that he is helping nurture this. We, we really need each other, you know, and in, in, in nurturing this lovingness to come forth in woman, you know, he's also realizing what it is to be a man, you know, to help generate this power in the feminine. And then she's generating this power in him, right? That's where it starts to get really beautiful because there's this, a circuit, this beautiful circuit that's running. Um, and then even on a more mundane level, you know, partners can really do this as the Sufis would say, this mirroring of each other. If they're on a conscious path with each other where they have the ability to communicate, uh, be, I'm just going to use the word ruthless, that's a little abrasive, but to be able to point out, give each other feedback around their egoic blind spots, to be humble enough to know I'm presenting myself in this relationship as an imperfect human being with a past, with things that I'm still working out with some scars, as we call them in yoga. And I'm entrusting you to see them with me. And perhaps because I'm so wrapped up in all my filters, you may be able to see them more clearly. And maybe you're going to have some insights for me so we can enthuse this soul evolution in each of us. They call conscious partnerships the esoteric shortcut in some mystical circles. The esoteric shortcut, you really accelerate very quickly. Uh, I've seen that in my own life. You know, I'm not with a partner right now, but when I've been in those conscious partnerships, it's it's amazing. And then the last thing I'll say on this is the most beautiful thing I've enjoyed is is creating together, you know, creating workshops. You know, one of my previous partners was a women's circle leader. She was on the tantric path as well. We used to run retreats for couples. We used to run tantric date nights in the city, you know, allowing couples to come together for an intentional evening of connection. These things were incredible to give to the world. You know, it was like almost from the bastion of our love, you know, these creations were were coming. And that was, you know, we really got to see that children of the mind concept, like, wow, our love is actually making these creations in the world that are beautiful and divine. So on that level, it, it really gets into that world saving place because a person who is well loved, you know, who is on this path of conscious love, they're not going to be a very aggressive, warlike, militant person. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence that where there is war in the world, these are places where the feminine and women are probably the most oppressed. Whereas in places where you don't have that, there tends to be a lot more peace. And I think we need to enthuse that. Yes, yeah, so true. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. First question mm. is, there's a lot of men, and I try and think, you know, the men watching and put in, you know, a word for them. If they think, oh, I would love a relationship like that, because one, the growth, as you said, you know, shortcut to enlightenment, and I am totally on board with that too, you know, the, through the, there's a lot of work to be done alone, but it's a certain point that certain things can only come from being in relationship so what do you say to men who would love a relationship like this but just haven't found the right woman yeah i mean there's a few different ways you could go about it i mean what first comes to mind for me which may be more sensible to men who are already on quite a spiritual path um and i'll offer something more pragmatic as well but what what really helped me i remember when i had my first conscious partnership um, I started really envisioning what I got very interested in Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And it was almost like I was doing prayers to Magdalene herself. I was doing prayers to the goddess and I was imagining what this woman must be like. And in so doing, I would kind of feel this like, Oh, but wait, there's these qualities, these patterns that I have that just would not be sensible in that kind of relationship. It was almost like she was calling me to this higher uh, expression of myself, like get to work, do some good discipline practice, you know? Um, so almost inviting and imagining that partner, like letting your heart send out the call. 
and start to already have that relationship energetically, like calling her in in that way will start to give you little cue points of like, hmm, maybe I should change this. It's it's almost like she'll start to already speak to you. It can sound a little mystical, uh, but that's been my experience of it. Um, and then I think on on a practical level, I mean, something that I know is serving a lot of the men in my life is I think for men, part of the journey is, and this may sound paradoxical, but it's about making adjustments in their masculinity, you know, and that may be about going to men's circles. Men's circles to me are one of the most incredible medicines. And I've been teaching men's circles for over a decade, leading them and uh, teaching men's retreats. And I've developed a whole course on the archetypes for men called Kings of the Heart. And one thing that I've seen is that, or rather when I started this, I feel that I was motivated by just seeing all the women's circles, you know, and I make, I make light of this a lot of my men's circles when I start them, you know, I'll be like, you know, didn't you notice like about 10 years ago, at least when I became quite more conscious, like I just noticed the women were all doing this work. They were like taking this big leap forward. And probably that's because viscerally they're, they're suffering more under patriarchy Men are suffering too. Their wounds are a lot more silent though. A lot of that has to do with the emotional availability of men, which we talked about a bit earlier. Uh, but what I started to see is women were really up leveling. And then I was like, man, if we don't get our shit together, they're just going to leave us behind and make some Amazonian island where they're just going to hang out with each other and, and, <laughs> and forget about us. So in some ways, I felt that the women were the ones who were setting this higher standard and calling us to it first um but when i started to get men together in circles i started to witness the medicine of brotherhood the met it's a real medicine when you get a bunch of men together in circle and you're allowed to be honest with each other to encourage each other to challenge each other in a healthy way there's this camaraderie that a lot of men do not have in their lives because again our culture is not modeling this for us you know men usually have these outlets of going to a sporting event or the strip club or having a few drinks after work but they generally seldomly have this context where they just get together and talk about their feelings their hopes their dreams their struggles their heroic journeys i've just seen over the years just one men's circle like the tonic that it gives to a man's soul who has not had that kind of masculine male connection before so profound um and then that gives him this container, you know, that his partner is eventually this woman that he'll call in will be safe in knowing that whatever's coming up for him that may mean negatively impacting the relationship, you know, negative patterns and stuff. He has this thing that he's going to, you know, every two weeks or whatever, where he's going to be, you know, showing up and sharing that, hopefully. And so he's going to have this honest, you know, support of men in his life that she can also feel supported in as well. I think that's, that's when it gets really beautiful and really joy juicy. And, you know, there's a, there's an obvious vice versa with that too, because women are doing that work as well. And I think that also the man can entrust that she's also going to be on that path of, of growth as well, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally in agreement with that. Um, mm. So from your work with, with men, what's the, what are our men struggling with at the most at the moment? Ah, oh, you know, it's amazing. It, it's, it, I think, I think that old wound, once again, the emotional stuff, even though it's, it's much less than it used to be. I've seen such an evolution with men, with their emotional intelligence. Um, but that can still be a tricky moment for men, how to be vulnerable, not only to themselves and a group of men in circle, but even more scary is probably being vulnerable to a woman. Because a lot of men will think that this is going to be emasculating, like she's not going to find this attractive. Uh, and so he usually internalizes it because he's just like, I, and also men, there's just this kind of primal, like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to share my, what I just start talking. You know, I, a friend of mine did a play years ago, a woman all about very interesting theater play about men's circles, 
you know, from what she was witnessing with her partner going through. And she, I thought she really rendered it well that these men would get together and some of them were just be like, Hey, let's share our feelings. And some of the men were just like, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. And they'd go into distress because they'd be like scared, you know, because when you first start allowing feelings to come out, it can bring up so much. Maybe you've had a father figure in your life that, you know, boys don't cry. So you've been punished for that. Maybe abused, abused for that. So that can be very, very difficult for men as well. Um, and then I think another struggle that men have is just, just around that giant energy of sex. You know, testosterone tends to condition men to be a lot more sexual in terms of like, just like the capacity for it, you know, just like if he's not in touch with, you know, how to discipline that energy, you know, there's going to be this very hungry lust that's just going to just control his life uh, and to really take that on how to really channel that into a loving partnership into lovingness if he so chooses because not everyone's choosing the path of monogamy but to do that requires like a holistic you know lifestyle change you know he's going to need the brotherhood he's going to need a lot of physical engagement with his body like i talked about at the beginning he's going to need to get you know, th those energies cathartically moving, cathartically out. But then he's going to want to do exercises with his body as well. They're going to continue to make him soft and sensuous. Um, he's going to want to, maybe if he's stuck in an addictive cycle, he's going to want to call in some some brothers who are really going to hold him to account, to accountability. Um, I think this is something that men are starting to realize more and more that we can't do this work alone. Being a lone wolf doesn't work anymore. And you know, warriors were bands of brothers, you know, they would band together and encourage each other. And to just not be ashamed, you know, especially when you fall, you know, because it's not about what happens when you fall. It's like, can you rise again, you know, and and often just sharing the fall with another conscious brother, another loving brother, is all you need to get lifted up again, because their hands going to reach to you in the ditch and pull you out. And all of a sudden, you're back on the path, you know, and you can just and then you fall again, that's okay. You know, it's it's also about allowing men to realize, and I think this can work for women as well, just, you know, I don't think we're alive in this era to be the perfect, pristine example of what it is to be human. I think we're almost the generations that are stopping that wheel of karma of the dark ages. And we're like stopping it, which in itself is like a huge momentous thing. And then we're like pushing it into the dharmic cycle, you know, into creation. Uh, turning the age into light and that's like amazing and i think in centuries from now that thing's going to be spinning in this beautiful spiral in the other way um but you know to 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 realize like we've got quite a lot of work to do and you know I, my indigenous elders really taught me this it's like you got to think six generations down the line like what are you doing now that's going to be generationally important and just see it as like you're taking the torch and passing it on um, I think that context can be really helpful as well, because, you know, men also can get stuck in the want to move mountains game of their egos, you know, wanting to be these dominator alphas, and then they can take on too much. I know this very well, because in my work, I've overwhelmed myself so many times I've burned out and because you just think you can do so much. And, and now, you know, in my 40s, you know, things start to slow down, you realize I need I need to rest more, I need to be more in that yin, you know. That's a beautiful thing as well. You can trust life. Life is always going to be presenting you through the vessel of your body, through the aging, the beautiful aging process, which is the soul's journey. It's also going to be guiding you. Yeah, it's so good, Darren. I want to get into the conversation around men and um, let's say um, ultimately semen retention and uh, the creative power that comes from that. But, you know, bringing it back to, you know, I don't know, but I imagine most men have got a daily habit of masturbation and, you know, spilling their life force. And what open this conversation up and talk to men, please, about the two different ends and where's the, where's the happy medium for most men? Yeah, so uh, there's so many different ways that we can access this. I mean, in some ways I like to take the approach with some men, which is more of a warrior way but to scare them sacred a little uh because i i also come from a chinese medicine background 
and in Chinese medicine, the the semen and the ova in women is regarded as the same substance. It's called the jing. And the jing is translated as essence. It's like literally the blood of your soul. It's the essence of who you are. Now, if you go back to the Taoist teachings, they often say the, the female is superior. And one of the expressions of that is that if you look at a woman's jing cycle, uh, her ova are timed with nature. Nature is presiding over it. You know, once a month, she will ovulate, she will release the eggs, she will bleed. Now, of course, there can be patholo pathology in her menstrual cycle. Maybe she's a heavy bleeder, there's clots, whatever. But generally, uh, she's she's in tune with nature, and that's irrevocable. For men, a man can sit there all day long and just lose essence after essence after essence. So there's a bit more of a responsibility there for men. Now, when we look at this jing, and we see that essence, one of the proverbs I love most in Chinese medicine is, essence is the virtue. Now, virtue in Chinese medicine is actually translated as the marvelous impulses that all humans have the potential to express. And these impulses tend to be very unifying by nature um, in the sense that they bring unity into the world. For example, the liver brings the virtue of benevolence and kindness. Um, the, the virtue of the lungs, the metal element brings courage and bravery. And when we have a lot of essence in our body, these virtues tend to be just naturally expressed a lot more. Now, when I look at a man who's retaining semen, this, this becomes very a deep knowing, an embodied knowing. When you've retained your semen, you start to realize, I have a lot more energy. And, and that energy tends to not just be a primal, I mean, yes, on one level, it's just I have a raw, more like ATP in my body. But on a higher level of my psyche, I have a lot more energy to be kind, to be graceful to be in control of my emotions. All of a sudden, I'm not this kind of like chaotic ship in a stormy sea. I have the ability to steer more, to be in my power. And that just comes from a naturalness. There's not, there's not, there's, the Taoists are very clear on this. They call it wu wei or not doing. You know, they're all about how when you let nature do its thing, when you work with nature, you realize that there's all these expressions that are just naturally occurring. So on that level, for a man, the semen retention is allowing him to be a much more, and I love this word, magnanimous man, someone who's expressing virtuous qualities in his life. And he will start to see all kinds of benefits. For one, he will notice that women will be more attracted to him. Now, you know, some people who, because the semen retention thing is very big now, which is great, but you see some of it's getting very poppy and superficial, you know, there's... Some people say, oh, you've retained your semen. Women are just going to know. There's this pheromones coming out of you. Yeah, maybe there's some pheromones. But I would say women will just know because you're more virtuous. And she, like the ladies of the ancient chivalric knights, they want the men to go out there and do quests and such so they can prove their worth, so they can prove their virtues, so that they're true gentle men. You know, a man who's like spilling a semen all the time, his neurology, his psychology is going to be in a state of chaos. He's going to be ill-tempered. He's going to be irritable. He's going to be also lazy and tired. He's going to be pendulum swinging between extremes. Whereas a man who's really got that in control, has really mastered himself, who's really tamed that dragon of lust, is able to then you know, present himself to a woman as someone who's very graceful, who's very gentlemanly, who's not going to get like atrociously angry at her for no reason, who's going to be pleasant to be around. He's probably going to be actually lively and joyful as well, sense of humor, which is so attractive. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the greatest benefits, you know, and this is why, you know, in, in my book, I have this phrase, you know, I truly understand what it means to be a man by loving woman. Uh, because when you start to attract women in this more natural way, and you start to realize that they will respond to that, and I think when men really observe their relationships, they will see that when they are out of alignment, you know, in some way, their relationship goes to shit. It's like it just happens and it can happen very quickly, which can be a gulp moment for men because it's like, oof, I've got to be on my game. But then isn't that the most amazing motivation to be on your game? Because if you're on your game for your woman, that means you're on your game for your job, for your friends, for your mission, which is like, pfft. 
this is where the the idea of romance i start to lean into what john lamb lash is saying i'm like whoa this is like a technology this is like an ancient technology that when it's handled in this way men and women can realize wow there's a tremendous responsibility and an opportunity here in this relationship we can really plug each other into this like force of relationship that can inspire the best in each other so i think that's that's another way of looking at it as well and just you know semen retention is the gateway to tantric sex you know because if you're choosing not to have an ejaculatory orgasm by itself you're going to just last longer <laughs> you know <laughs> and that in itself is just going to be more pleasure for her and more pleasure for you and that's kind of like a beginning point for a lot of men i think is just realizing wow i lasted longer and that felt great because when a man gives his woman pleasure you know where where she's you know a well loved woman that is the source of a lot of a man's confidence you know whether he likes to admit it or not and men who are who are who have learned to be good lovers know that you know and that's that's a really beautiful feeling yeah such a great topic and one that i know will you know relevant to all men wherever they are and wherever they they want to go because there's also the creative power right that comes with that and uh, do you find that uh when you're practicing you know your creativity expands and um and goes to new dimensions as well massively massively um Napoleon Hill talks about this in Think, Think and Grow Rich. You know, there's a whole chapter on sexual continents, you know, just getting a handle on that sexual energy has a direct translation into greater and stronger creativity because it's the creative force. It's a generative force. I mean, semen creates life. It's the seeds that then fertilize the egg, right? So that's those seeds could be creative seeds as well so that is a huge yeah i mean i've seen that massively in my life like and and i i felt very blessed you know i've had a very i've i've been a very copiously expressed artist you know i put out a lot of music <laughs> now starting to write books and and i attribute a lot of that into you know having a pretty good management around my you know ejaculations keeping that virtue in uh and i mean there's a whole other conversation about you know the semen and the christ oil you know there's this whole esoteric understanding now about i don't know if you've heard about the christ oil but that's and that's in women too um but with men again there's so much more of a loss that can happen in the ejaculation but just another confirming that this energy and i and i do believe there's gold in semen too i think there's liquid gold in there and there's so many just physiologically minerals and i mean you just you can see why when a man is on the other end of the spectrum and is just like ejaculating all the time like it makes sense physiologically because you're just losing so many vitamins minerals and then all the metaphysical stuff that we've gone into um so and you know when you look at the world and how it's set up um, the hypersexuality, the lustfulness that's just projected from popular culture. I'm a slave for you, Britney Spears, and all the other pop artists. You know, it's like, whew, we're we're besieged by a culture that's trying to enable that lustfulness that doesn't want men to be strong, that wants their seeds. You know, that's uh, you could even say on a demonic level, the succubi. You know, these female demonic beings who I've encountered in astral travels, you know, like these things are real. Um, you know, we are in a struggle here and in some ways our sexuality is the battleground. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's so true because, you know, the the explosion and the, the easy access of pornography and, you know, encouraging men to, you know, lose their life force when you see the power of what retaining that life force does and creates you know, is it weaponized? You know, there's a huge discussion, which, you know, I, I believe it is. So uh, absolutely, to, absolutely. To bring that into awareness for men, you know, uh, are they are, uh, is their masculinity being attacked? And for what reason? And, you know, just really mm -hmm. not 
into the power of, of how it is to, to, you know, live at the other end of the spectrum. And that's a great context to ignite, you know, the warrior in men and the king in men. Because when they start to apprehend that there is this, this kind of war going on, you know, and we shouldn't be afraid of using that word. We can handle it in different ways. But there is a, there is a war for the souls of humanity going on. And when we learn how to, uh, first of all, see what we're up against, you know, that can in itself just rouse a man to like pull out his sword and get to work and get to battle. But, you know, I, I love, you know, your podcast, Heart Warriors. I mean, this is not about, you know, fighting with violence. This is a spiritual battle. So it takes a whole new kind of ingenuity and skillfulness. Uh, it takes virtue, really. The best way to win is to be virtuous, to be magnanimous, to be this great soul like Mahatma Gandhi in the world, who was a non a proponent of nonviolence. And he was able to liberate a whole country from tyranny. I mean, you can see the power of the soul on that level. Um, so I do, I do like that context. And I like using that for men as well, because, uh, you know, in some ways, I think the spiritual circles that we can circulate in, sometimes they have those rogue color, colored glasses on too much, and it's too much about the love and the light. Uh, but, you know, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing us that he doesn't exist. Uh, and when you really look at the fact that there is this very anti-life energy in the world, um, there is a darkness uh, that we don't necessarily have to fight against again with like full frontal aggression. Uh, but to know it's there, you know, cures that naivete that I think we're conditioned with in this culture so that we can get wise enough and realize like, oof, why it's so important to make my life as holy as possible to build a temple of love, you know, for myself and my family to exist in and to really question the culture that's coming at us. And to disengage from it. I mean, that was the essence of what Gandhi was, was teaching was just don't cooperate. You know, the minute we start to like take our money out, take take all the means that we're connected to the system out, it starts to collapse. You know, and I think more humans are starting to realize that. And then in so doing with all this new creativity that we've been galvanizing with our sacred sexuality, then we can actually create the new world because we need to create a world right now. It's like, we're not just creating like better lives, we're creating a better world. And that requires a lot of love, you know, a love that's been made into something much more heroic than, than we've been formally believed it could be. Yeah, oh, look, this is like probably my favorite like topic of all time, you know, to talk about all uh -huh. stuff. And we could probably, I know we could talk for hours and hours, but yeah. Um, what I'd like to do, because, you know, we will start wrapping up soon, Darren, is um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to bring into this conversation anything that I haven't um, invited you to speak about. What haven't I, what haven't you spoken about that you feel is important to say about men, masculinity, sexuality, the healing journey? Wow. You know, Gemma, it's been so great connecting with you because i feel like we've covered so much terrain um but i guess one thing that I, I i guess i'd like to and it's just jumping more into what we've already been saying is that i just like call upon men to bring back romance you know but bring bring it back in this new way you know um women uh want to be loved they want to be devoted to um, it doesn't mean that we that men have to give too much up because it's this very big balance. You know, it's like you see it in some relationships, you can fall into codependency and manipulation. But there's something about romance that the world is really lacking, you know, and all the things that we've talked about, you know, the skillfulness that we can bring into our lovemaking in it, it's about becoming a gardener of our love you know and the garden of our love needs to be tended and and i think men need to open themselves the possibility that i can be in a fulfilling loving partnership for the rest of my life with this woman that can become the the most glorious nexus for our mutual growth and that that love is a service to the world you know because it's going to emanate from our life we're going to become such virtuous beings by that love uh, that our presence and our service to the world will then be so much more uplifted. So really contextualizing it 
that big. Um, I think it's time to bring, you know, men and women together more as well. You know, it's been the men's and women's circles have been great. And, and I'm starting to lean now more into work of like, let's reunite them. You know, I feel like we needed this like an alchemy. You need to separate, you know, to then bring in this new transcendent whole, you know, so I, I'd encourage men and those men who are in men's circles all over the world, because it's such a movement now is, you know, getting in touch with uh, women's circles in your communities and saying, hey, is there some way that we could work together? Maybe it's just once a year coming together in sacred ceremony. But some of the most transformational things I've ever seen is when those circles have been brought back, back together, which I've been doing that work. And when you get men and women coming together and having these kinds of earnest conversations as we've been having, Oof, it, it's mind blowing because there's still a lot of ignorance on either both sides of the equation about what what are men struggling with, what are women struggling with, how can we mutually support each other. That that inherent communication uh, still needs to be you know activated a, a lot more. But just just in talking together more uh, from this conscious space, the understanding uh, that that really lays you know the groundwork for a lot of the lovingness to to come it really it really tends to the soil yeah definitely um i want to ask you go just going back i had a question i've been meaning to ask the whole time since you spoke in the mm. beginning about um the when you were talking about the loving couple coming together in bed and having that aura you know you i think you described it from memory as sort of like two halves coming together so mm -hmm. My understanding of um, conscious relationships is that it's like two holes coming together and that overlap of the vesica Pisces, which is ultimately mm. the power of life, is the relationship. So mm. what's the, what is this discussion and where do you stand on this, either two halves coming together or two holes overlapping? You know, I like to say that in the new earth and in 5D, uh, many things can be true at the same time <laughs> and that's not to cop out it's it's to say that i think both both are true you know i think on one dimension of reality we are whole unto ourselves you know like i don't need to be in partnership i can be you know and there are times in a person's life where it's very it's very good to hermit you know and to be in that inner vigil of self-loving but then i think on another dimension there it is almost like i mean there's stories apparently in lemuria and such we were like this hermaphroditic being the human was more of this hermaphrodite that had both male and, and female aspects and that there was this kind of split of the genders of the sexes uh, and that's created this kind of drama of men and women now and that yearning that attraction that we feel is kind of that longing to commune and plug back together and I do think just 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 looking viscerally at a male and female body, you know, when the coitus happens, it is kind of like a plug into a socket. You know, there's like two holes that are only complete when they come together. And isn't it interesting that when they come together, all of a sudden there's all this bliss and the highest vibrations that we ever felt. So I think both of those can exist because I always come back as well to Kilo Gibran's beautiful book, The Prophet, you know, and he says on on marriage. He's like, never forget, you're both two pillars holding up, you know, the same temple and you're supposed to dance with each other, but then also honor that you both have your own path there still. Um, I think there's some truth to that as well. And I think there's also just the mystery that we're pioneers right now. It's John Wellwood, who kind of brought forward conscious partnership in his books. He talks a lot about how like, Partnership in the 21st century is a mystery. Let's explore. Let's see what it's about because it's not it's, there's it's not about arranged marriages as much anymore. It's not about women at home and men in you know in the wild doing the hunting. It's like there's there's room to really innovate and grow. And there's also these primal technologies we're working with with our biology and with polarity and stuff. But I think opening things up a lot more to that innovation is really beautiful too. Um, but yeah, I mean. There is there is something just so profound about this whole topic, you know, and, and I think there's good reason that it's arresting so many people, their attention, you know, tantric workshops, conscious partnership. It's like it's all over the world now. And I think it's because 
there is this inherent knowing that if men and women can foist this this higher development, this higher expression of partnership, and really learn how to use their sexuality in this profoundly healing and generative way, it's it's going to be an integral medicine for creation of the new earth. Love it. Love it so much. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's start wrapping up now, Darren. Um, two things left, please. Um, let people know where they can find you, give your new book a plug. And, um, and after that, I'll ask you to deliver a final message to men, please. Okay. Thanks, Gemma. <laughs> So I think the best way to find me is my website, darrenaustinhall.com. Uh, all of my things are there. I'm also heavily on Instagram, Darren Druid. Uh, and I also have loads of music on streaming platforms, sound healing, shamanic, like healing music uh, on Apple Music, Spotify. And you can also find me on YouTube, Darren Austin Hall there. And I just started a channel on Rumble, so I've been having a bit of censorship on YouTube, as many of us truth tellers are finding these days. Um, and then my my first book was just released, and it's called Love's Revolution. It's a very beautiful and big collection of writing on sacred sexuality, divine romance, the path of conscious partnership. It's it's got poems in there, ecstatic poems, spiritual erotic poems. Uh, there's a series of writings and essays on all kinds of topics. And it's bookended by two really interesting short stories. One is called The Rise of Eve. It's my retelling of the Garden of Eden myth from the perspective of Eve being this kind of divine priestess who's seeking an up-level in her knowledge. So she willfully goes to partake in the eating of this psychedelic fruit and then goes to teach Adam about this new level of consciousness that she's unlocked. And then the final story, The Sacred Union of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, is a spiritual erotic story of Jesus and Mary making love in a temple before uh, all these young students in their sacred sexuality class in the mystery school. And this is their final exam to watch their blessed teachers make love to them. And it's a very educational story because it goes into a lot of different tantric and sacred sexuality techniques. It's ultimately my attempt to really render the aesthetic beauty of what sacred sexuality could look like uh, through these beautiful blessed protagonists. Um, and it's out now on Amazon uh, and on my YouTube. I've been doing lots of little videos of reading the poems of the ambient music and little films I've been making. So you can find that as well. Sounds amazing. I'm definitely going to be looking into that and I will no doubt buy your book too because I've got this beautiful collection of books on sacred sexuality. And to be honest, I often don't get to, to read them, but I just like having them there. And it's like <laughs> osmosis and, you know, it's like one day I read them. but And then, you know, but now I'm sort of trying to... Um, get more into reading the books that have just been sitting on my shelf for so long. So I love Excellent. the sound of that. Amazing. Okay, Darren, final message to men, men that are maybe struggling, going through a dark time at the moment in a challenging phase of their life. What will you say to those men? Oh, I would say to those brothers that your, your soul is divine. Your masculinity is divine and know that no matter what you are going through, that there is a resilient being inside of you that knows what to do. If you're honest in those silent moments of meditation, you will hear that voice and give your suffering, give whatever struggles you have into the power of prayer, call on the resource of that divine fatherly energy. And if you're really looking to get on the path, I would say the best action step you can do is type in your town, your city's name and men's circle and find the nearest men's circle. And if you struggle to find one, you can always reach out to me. I have a online men's circle that I run as well. Uh, and I have a program called Kings of the Heart, but there's lots of organizations that are showing up all over the world, the Mankind Project, Sacred Sons come to mind. There's no better way to accelerate your growth, brother, than to get in touch with those other heart warrior men who are out there doing the work already and they're just waiting to just welcome you joyfully into that circle of transformation and, and solidarity, sacred solidarity. Yeah, it's so exciting to see this, you know, there's, there's some momentum of the men's movement. It's incredible. Mm. It's just, you know, for, well, for me, you know, sort of watching, it's just such a blessing and, um, and definitely, mm -hmm. you know, the, the builders of the new earth with the heart energy is, uh, 
is where is what is needed. So mm -hmm. what an amazing conversation, Darren. Absolutely love yeah, it. Thank you, so Gemma. Much. Thank you. Me too. Great questions. <laughs> really engaged, really engaging. Oh, awesome. So I'll drop all Darren's links below. Make sure you check him out. And um, and I really look forward to possibly in the future, we'll get you back on Manspeak. I am sort of wrapping up the series, but <laughs> it's like, I mean, Heart Warriors will wrap up at 100 unless I get someone who I just, you know, feel really drawn to interview. But Men speak might go on for a bit longer and obviously conversations like this um, I'm always very happy to have so yeah thank you so Beautiful. much well for thank you up. for having me it's been such a delight thank you Gemma my pleasure everyone if you could like share subscribe and I'll be back next week with another episode of Heart Warriors bye <laughs> stay on if you like yeah.